Okay, so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Peter Dian from um, the um, Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics here in Tübingen. Um, and yeah, Peter is um, really well known for his uh, co-authorship on the theoretical neuroscience book that many of you may know, might know. And um, he has great work um, from the 90s uh, where um he yeah proved um um q learning uh convergence in uh, reinforcement learning and also associated reinforcement learning with dopamine signals in the brain um that's uh, what he's most known for i think and um yeah um peter um is the director of our institute here um leading the um group of computational neuroscience and he will today talk about replay and preplay in human planning. And without further ado, uh, the stage is yours, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the introduction. I think it's like 30 years. This is shocking to think that it, these, those things were 30 years ago. But I'm going to talk about something which is a little bit more recent, I hope. Um, I should apologize. There may be a bit of background noise in the early part of my talk, um, but, but, but uh, um, uh, apologies for that. It should go, go away. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about replay and preplay in human planning. So a, a lot of this work has been done with an, a number of fantastic people um, over the last few years. So particularly Zev Kurth Nelson, who's uh, currently working at DeepMind. He was a postdoc with Ray Dolan and myself in London. Eran Eldar, who's at the Hebrew University in uh, Jerusalem, uh, also worked with uh, Ray and myself. And then Georgie Antonov, who's a student in my current lab. Chris Gagney, who was a postdoc who just, uh, just recently left and Gareth Barnes, who works on MEG at, uh, in, in London. So a lot of the work you'll, you'll, you'll hear really relates to, uh, to them. So I please encourage you to uh, take advantage of your cubular microphone and uh, ask me questions during or on Zoom, um, uh, because uh, yeah, this is more like a school than a, than, a, than a seminar, and we have plenty of time. So the plan for the talk, uh, I'm going to start off by setting up uh, sort of the background for what I really want to talk about. So that background is a little bit uh, extensive, but I hope it will be interesting because it's some modern methods in essentially in, in cognitive neuroscience. So I'm going to talk a bit about replay in the, con in the context of both rodents and humans. Then I'm going to say a word about um, a very sort of influential or interesting division that we see that's very, that has run through the dichotomy that's run through psychology for at least you know, 50 or 60 years which we talk about in terms of model-based and model-free learning and planning. So you might think about that as system two and system one in terms of Kahneman, Tversky, or Stanovich and West, for instance. And then I'm gonna talk about how we use, we sort of synergize these two sets of ideas. So we do have, um, so Iran Eldar designed a very simple uh, eight state planning task that we conducted when people were in an MEG scanner, um, which is how we're going to measure replay in the context of humans. What we found is some very interesting differences between our subjects in the way, the way that they engaged uh, in model-based versus model-free planning. And those differences were reflected in the structure of replay that we, that we showed. And I'll try and provide then a context what that looks like. And then um, at the end, talk about our model of why we saw, we, why, why we might have seen the sort of replay that we did with the sort of behavioral consequence that was uh, observed. And talk a bit about forgetting and, and relearning as a function of what replay is doing. And then if I have time right at the end, I'll just say a word about another function that we think is important for this sort of replay uh, for ex in the context of exploration. Okay, so um, let's start off with, a, with the, 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 so the, the hardest data we know about uh, offline and online replay. And this is a phenomenon that has been known for the last 30 or so years based on rodents. And here's some lovely data from Deba and Bujaki, which really explains this. So as I'm sure many of you will know, in the hippocampus of um, rodents, there are place cells. So these are cells which fire when the animal is at a particular place in its environment. So here we see a rat who can, is on a linear track. So it can run in this case from left to right. And um, what uh, deep, what uh, actually this is a picture from Lauren Frank, but using these data, what they've done is to color parts of the track from blue to red. And then they've recorded here simultaneously, in this case, 13 cells, one up to 13 here. And each line here is a spike of a single cell. And they've colored these spikes by the color of, of uh, the, you know, the color, which is associated with where in space this cell likes to fire. So you can see why these cells might be called place cells, because this cell fires in the blue area, this cell fires in the red area and the orange area and so forth. 
So when the rat, and then this shows the velocity of the, of the rat. So here he's running from left to right. He's stationary. He runs. He then becomes stationary again. You can see here the EEG in the hippocampus. So famously, this is called the theta rhythm, um, which is a when the animal's actively engaged in moving through the environment, you see this, uh, this sort of theta rhythm like this. And you can see very nicely this sort of sequence of activation um, uh, during this time. What you can also see is when the, when the animal is stationary, so it's not moving, both before this particular run and after this particular run. So in this context, the animal will typically run left to right, stop for a bit, then run right to left and so forth. And I should say that these cells are directional, which means that they fire when the cell, rat's running. You know, this cell fires at this location when the animal is running left to right. It won't fire at all when it's running um, uh, uh, right to left. And what you see is that during these epochs, just before um, the animal runs and afterwards, when it's stationary, maybe eating food, you can see that these cells are again activated. And if we look in finer timescale detail, so now this is seconds, this is now 250 milliseconds, you can see that in this instance, before the animal runs, you see this beautiful little burst of forwards activity, where we can define forwards as meaning that these cells are activated you know, uh, spontaneously when the animal's not moving through the environment. But it, you know, it's as if it's thinking about moving through the environment in this coordinated forwards manner. And this actually, this, this EEG pattern, also this expanded timescale, is known as a sharp wave ripple, which is the, the context of when these things happen. And again, if you look afterwards, you can see that again, we get most of these neurons activated and you get another little uh, packet burst. But in this instance, they're actually activated backwards. So this is reverse replay. And we know that because um, again, because these cells are unidirectional. So we can identify the, the order of the replay itself. Um, so the many investigators since these early ones have, uh, have, have investigated these. Um, so Chishvari, Dupre, Foster and so forth. Many, there are lots of, there's a huge wealth of work looking at aspects of replay, uh, both during real sleep, but here also during quiet wakefulness, which is more the context we're going to see in MEG. And it's known, and it took them about 20 years, but then after 20 years or so, they started to find relationships between these aspects of replay and aspects of behavior. So for instance, you can see this re so the aspects of pre-play or replay at choice points in a maze, that the animals may be thinking you know, forwards or uh, left or uh, forwards or in, in, or in front of it when it's deciding to go left or right, for instance. But the, it's worth saying that the relationship with behavior is quite complicated. So we know, for instance, the reverse replay seems to be modulated by reward. You know, forward sequences can in some cases predict choice. So there's quite a rich structure of what replay is like. As an example of one of the more interesting, um, or it's a behaviorally interesting findings that, uh, that was discovered. This is a paper from Matt van der Meer's lab. What they did here was have the animal um, uh, behave in an environment which is uh, where it would start here, and it could choose to go either left or and where, where upon it would get food, or go right where upon it would get water, and then it would come back to the start and they could run again. So a classic way that you run these tasks is uh, you have some pre-task, you, you bring the animal out of its um, um, nest, uh, out of its uh, uh, home cage, you put it on a to, to rest for a bit. You can measure replay when it's sleeping. It often it will sleep or just um, you know, groom then. You then run, you know, in this case, 15 to 20 trials per session in this maze. Then you have post-task rest. And what the what the carry et al did was to measure these sorts of replay events during the whole time. But the innovation in this study is that they had alternate days in which the animal was water deprived, so water restricted and food restricted, water restricted, food restricted, just on alternate days which means that of course on a water restricted day, uh, he wants to go right. On a food restricted day, he's going to tend to go left to get the, to get the food. So what do they find when they did this? So the, um, the black line here shows experience. So it's basically it's probability of choice. And indeed, and this is probably of choosing food. So on a water restricted day, as you might imagine, he more frequently goes to the um, water side. So the probability of food is low. On a food restricted day, he goes more to the food side. So you get this nice zigzag pattern reflecting the efficacy of their training protocol or their exposure protocol. What's interesting for us, though, is that now what they look at is these sharp wave ripple events. So they decoded the activity in the hippocampus. And they could ask whether or not when you're decoding these events, you know, the, just like those fast events I showed when the animal's actually not there, are they decoding on the food arm or the water arm? And you can see that on a day on which they're going to the water arm, most of the sequences, and they showed it's the same um, across all the, the pre-task, post-task, and during the maze itself. Most of these sequences are actually for the food arm. 
And on a day where he mostly visits the food, most of the sequences are for the water. So you see an inverse characteristic of what, the, uh, of what these, um, these uh, replays are like. And then when we come back in about in a half an hour's time or so to look at the human data, we'll see a reflection of this in the human data that we saw, and then we'll provide an interpretation of this. I should say that the interpretation that um, um, Van der Meer had was to say that maybe this is involved somehow in maintaining the integrity of the hippocampal map, which is to say that if the animal knows you're going to spend a lot of time going to the water side on day one, then these replay events that are maintaining the activity of the place cells on the food side so that it doesn't disturb the map. That might be, we're going to provide a different interpretation, which has to do with planning later. Peter? Yes. Um, just a clarification question. Um, I don't know, do you want to take questions? Yeah, absolutely, yes, please do ask okay. questions. Right. Uh, so this um, replay that you're showing there is forward replay, right? It's kind of planning. Actually, they showed it doesn't, it's similar for both forward and, oh, sorry, it says reward. It's ah, yeah, you, yeah. Forward and reverse okay. replays, I'm sorry. Fair enough. Oh, that's my, my typo. Yeah, so right. one of the strange things about this is indeed people have shown uh, quite a lot of distinction for different sorts of replay in other tasks like forward. So like David Foster showed when an animal's planning to get home from a distal part in a maze, you see forward replay consistent with the direction that he chooses. But in, the, that, in this Van der Meer study, they said that didn't, uh, they, they didn't find any relationship between um, forwards versus re reverse. And also they didn't even find relative to pre versus post tasks, for instance. Or, uh, of course, the animal knows what state he's in based on the previous um, experience. Thanks. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. So, how does this look in humans? Okay. So, I'm going to tell you about our first, so Zedkirth Nelson's first study to look at this, which was in a context of a very simple experimental paradigm. So we were not at all sure that anything would work. Um, so, the paradigm is something we borrowed from a Wimmer and Shahani where they had done something in fMRI, and it's called sensory preconditioning. So let me explain uh, how this works. So in a sensory preconditioning experiment has three phases, an association phase, a reward phase, and a decision phase. And the association phase, you, make, you, the, you encourage subjects to make an association between, in our case, um, three different sorts of, um, uh, of uh, pictures. So a face, a, um, a, uh, uh, a body part, and a, and a place and fractal patterns. So here you can see these fractal patterns, which are, which are just arbitrary uh, patterns. Then during a reward phase, we pair the fractal patterns, some fractal patterns with reward and some fractal patterns with nothing. And then in a decision phase, we come and ask uh, whether or not the subjects, this is the, the days that plans were rewarding. Um, in the decision phase, we ask whether or not subjects prefer or the, those stimuli which are associated with reward and also whether they prefer those stimuli that were associated with the fractal patterns that were associated with reward. So the way that Wimmer and Shahami ran it is that there were a number of different landscapes paired with these fractal patterns, each with its own fractal pattern. And then one of the landscapes, uh, one of the fractal patterns associated with the landscapes was rewarded, one of it was not. So let's say this was one that was not rewarded, this uh, pattern here. And so then, um, and then we could come back and ask whether the subject preferred the fractal pattern that itself was rewarded. And then this landscape was paired with this fractal pattern. Was it, was it preferred? And this one landscape was paired with this other fractal pattern that was not rewarded. We could do the same thing for these three different classes of, um, of, of stimuli. So to be uh, precise, what we did is just um, have a sequence, just usually in these cases, you just provide a sequence of images. And subjects were actually had, a, had an incidental task. They were searching for one where the picture was upside down. And then of course we threw out the, one, the pictures that were upside down. Um, and uh, we made sure that there was no previous liking preference for these, uh, for these pictures, right? Otherwise, of course, that would have disturbed the, uh, the, the experiment. Then we showed um, 18 trials per fractal. So they just see these uh, different fractals here. Then we come back and then do a six, six pairwise choices between all these fractals and the repeated four times to see what happens. So um, the way that, that Wimmer and Shahami had set up this task is that it actually is a very weak sort of sensory preconditioning. So here you see that uh, if we ask again at choice at the end, um, subjects had a clear preference for the, for the fractal pattern that was associated with reward over the fractal pattern that wasn't. But they had no net preference for the, um, the picture that was associated with the fractal pattern that was associated with reward. So from a sensory preconditioning perspective, from a behavioral perspective, this, um, this um, experiment was essentially a failure. 
But what they did, and what we're going to do, is to look to see whether we can predict, using some of the activity that happens during the reward phase, what's going to, what the preference will be, the selective preference during the decision phase. So we can see it, um, for the, in some sense, in this task, you can solve it in one of, at least one of two ways. Uh, one is to say that when you see the fractal pattern, when you see the, the landscape, it brings to mind the associated fractal pattern, and that brings to mind the reward. That's sort of a model-based prospective reasoning. The other is that during the reward phase, when subjects saw the fractal pattern, it might bring to mind the associated landscape, and then the landscape itself could be attached to the reward that was, uh, was presented. What we're on a Shahami using fMRI argued is that that's what's happening. And they showed that the strength of something like the decodability of fMRI for the, um, for the, for the type of the object, for the type of the picture, was correlated with the with the, um, uh, uh, the the landscape by landscape preference for that particular picture. So we're going to show something similar, and so take advantage of the weakness of sensory preconditioning to have more um, ability to show what so what might actually be ha happening in this case. Okay, so um, we did this in the MEG scanner. So here's what MEG pictures. Uh, here's what MEG responses look like. So here we have subjects in our regular old um, MEG scanner. So we have the order of 300 sensors, so squids, these superconducting quantum interference devices. And here we can get a signal essentially at a very high time resolution. So compared to fMRI, so it's measuring these magnetic fields over the brain, but of course it's a much worse spatial resolution. And here, in response to like a body part, you can see the evolution of activity in the brain here um, shown at 100 millisecond intervals. In the end, we have split it into 10 millisecond bins, but here you can see. And so, yeah, as you might expect, activity starts, you know, there's essentially nothing select, interesting selected before the image comes on. Then after a while, you see um, a, uh, um, a pattern of activity that starts in the, in the back of the brain where visual cortex is. And then it, then it sort of moves uh, forward. And you can see, even by eye, that there's something a little bit different about these activities. So maybe the face starts a little bit earlier than the, uh, than the others. And what we can do using that is to build a decoder, just take the 10 millisecond by 10 millisecond activity in, the, um, in the, uh, every sensor that we have. So we're not trying to do source localization or anything. And then try and decode, for instance, what the uh, stimulus type is. So is it a body part, a face, or a landscape? So when you do that, so here we're trying to predict the category of the, of the stimulus during this preconditioning phase. Um, here's the accuracy of our predictor based on, of course, this is when they're actually seeing the pictures themselves as a function of the time after we um, presented it. Um, and what you see is, if, you know, as you might hope for a good quality um, uh, machine learning, there's no decodability before the picture comes on. That's good. And then it builds up over time after, after the stimulus comes on at zero milliseconds here to um, actually what looks like two peaks, one peak at around 200 milliseconds and another peak at around 400 milliseconds. We showed that in fact, there's actually a significant dip. So there's a quadratic effect, you know, which are a dip um, um, between these two. Um, so that shows that we have so some interesting capacity to decode. There are three categories, so, they, so chance is at 33%. So you can see we're much, much better than chance in this instance. Um, so we were very, of course, very intrigued by this, um, these two decoding peaks. And so here we've done what's called representational similarity analysis. So we've said for each of the four faces that we had, four body parts and four places, we asked how similar is the pattern of activity at this 200, between 200 and 210 milliseconds across the sensors. So this is just a correlation, if you like, between the activity of the sensors at 200 milliseconds and 400 milliseconds. So at 400 milliseconds, you can see that the activity is very is quite similar between all the faces. That means when, no, no matter which face you have, the activity is quite similar, but quite different between the faces and the body parts and so forth. Whereas at 200 milliseconds, you see something which seems to be selective only for the particular pattern, just for you know, face one is not similar to face two. Whereas here, you see a much stronger similarity between face one and face two at 400 milliseconds. So therefore, it looks to us like the 200 millisecond window is the, uh, is the, is the face specific um, time and 400 milliseconds is a category specific time. And it's interesting to think about you know, how they are on the brain, but we're not going to talk about that here. Another piece of evidence in favor of this early window is we also tried to predict the fractal pattern. So here there were, of course, many more fractal patterns. So chance is, is much lower, one in whatever, six or seven or something. Um, but again, uh, the fractal pattern, they don't have a class, right? They're all, you know, there's no particular class for fractal pattern. 
they're just arbitrary fractals. And so you can see that again, it's uh, the, the decodability for the fractals, which we're actually not going to use for anything in the task, is enhanced again at an earlier point. And there's actually some lovely work by Radic Chichi and um, Ord Oliver looking at a much wider group of sensory of, of visual stimuli, showing you get this nice decodability um, at different times for different uh, uh, classes of stimuli. So I encourage you to read that paper from uh, Nature Neuroscience. Okay, so this is what it looks like when a picture is actually presented. But of course, what we had was a, like a harder task, which is to say that during the reward phase, when we're not presenting the, the, you know, the body part or the, or the face or the landscape, could we, could, if the fractal brought to mind the landscape or, or whatever it was associated with, maybe we would be able to decode something about the picture that was associated with that, um, with that fractal. So what we've done here is during the reward phase, we have these two times, we have when the fractal comes on and when the reward is provided, we made a mistake, I'll tell you about that in a minute. We see now, this is time after the, fract the fractal is presented, so it was presented for about two seconds. Um, this is which of these little decoders are we testing? So are we testing similarity of the brain or classification in the brain for decoders, which are at different time points after the, um, the, the, the built, for different time points after the stimulus is actually there. We just run those classifiers and say, is there anything in the brain after the fractal pattern comes on, that would allow us to decode the category of the picture that was associated with that fractal? And then if so, which bit of this stimulus could we decode? And so what you see is about 400 milliseconds after the fractal comes on, we're able to decode the 200 millisecond bit of the, uh, the 200 millisecond brain activity that was associated with this category. So that's actually the specific, the face, you know, the, 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 the landscape or face specific part of that, um, of that category. After the outcome comes on, so that's zero point here, you can see that uh, rather more shortly after that, uh, uh, out the outcome comes on, we're able to recover the 400 millisecond part of this, which is now category specific rather than, rather than picture specific uh, outcome. And the mistake we made was to have a fixed time between the fractal and the, out, and the and outcome. So we can't formally know whether this is something which is tied actually to the pre presentation of the outcome, the reward, or whether it's tied to the presence of the, uh, the fractal pattern itself. Now, um, this result itself is, I think, interesting on, on a, a few grounds. So one is, you know, it's really exciting that we actually got this, re, uh, this re recurrence of a pattern of activity that was actually not being presented at all, right? So we didn't present the, the picture at this time, just the fractal. We could still decode something which in the brain was normally um, created when the object is actually presented visually to the, to, the, to the subject. The second thing is, remember I told you that the actual sensory preconditioning was rather weak. And we can maybe understand that by reflecting that the way that we did it was to have you know, one fractal associated with a uh, one fractal associated with reward that was associated with one landscape, another fractal associated with no reward for a different landscape. But if the reward that we see here inspires a recovery of just the type of the stimulus, so landscape versus body part versus face, which is what we see at this 400 milliseconds, you can see why the subjects would not have a particularly good understanding that it's this particular landscape that's associated with reward or this as opposed to the other landscape because what we're recovering is just that this fractal was associated with landscapes at that time but nevertheless what we uh, what we can do is to ask um, whether our ability to recover not the 400 millisecond part of this um, pattern of the, of the reward but rather the 200 millisecond or any of the other parts was that correlated with the subsequent preference of the subject for the, the particular landscape that we saw or the particular body part or the particular face that had been associated with the fractal that was associated with reward. And so now you see that indeed, but now not at the, that early case, the 100 millisecond, which is what's recovering the 400 millisecond part of this picture, but rather at about 400 milliseconds after the reward, which is 2.4 seconds after the stimulus, you can see that the, um, the significance of the, uh, of the 200 millisecond um, part of the, of the category, so this is now the face or body part or landscape specific recall, was correlated with the subject's subsequent um, uh, uh, willingness to prefer the picture that was associated with that time. So, and we can then do some statistics and show that that's actually appropriate, even corrected for all times. So it's, it's like Bonferroni, even Bonferroni corrects. Um, 
Okay, so what we learned from this is it's possible to look at, re, to, to decode this MEG signal uh, fairly accurately, even when the picture itself is not there on the screen, even when it's actually not being, not being presented. Secondly, we can see that that actually has a behavioral significance in the sense that we can actually recover the, um, the association here that something happens later when the, um, when the, uh, when the subjects later um, prefer that stimulus over another stimulus. And we actually see quite a bit about the structure of what the recall looks like during that time. Any questions on sensory preconditioning? Yeah, maybe this is a good point to have questions. <laughs> Um, sure. While we fix the camera. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> There's audience um, camera which is frozen, but I think we could live with this worst case. Yeah. So there was one in the back. I tossed the cube. Hi. Um, so I was I was just wondering. So when the reward is so when the uh, fractal is associated with the landscape uh, you kind of keep that association but when you show the landscape you're not gonna think of the, like you're not gonna associate with the reward um right away right so yeah i was just a bit confused on what are you showing like in the in the last slide okay so the in the last slide, in this last slide here. Yeah. Okay. So what's shown here is uh, sorry for being confusing. So indeed, during the reward phase, we don't present. Um, uh, like, get you through that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, sorry, uh, somebody said. Um, during the reward phase, we don't present the landscape at all, right? Uh, we are only showing the fractal pattern. Uh, and what we're asking is um, uh, whether our ability to decode. The, um, the, the, the subject's ability to say during the decision phase that they prefer the, um, this landscape over this landscape. How correlated that is that with our ability to decode something about the category, that's what we're decoding, of the, uh, the, 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 the that fractal was associated with during the reward phase itself. And the idea is that during the reward phase, the fractal pattern brings to mind the particular landscape that was being presented. There. And um, as a result of that bringing to mind, it then associates that particular landscape with the reward. And so the evidence for that is that the, um, that we, uh, so is to say, can we decode something about the category? So that's the landscape category. But, as a, uh, but the bit of the category that we are able to uh, decode is the bit that's associated with this 200 millisecond peak. And we argued that that 200 millisecond peak is actually associated with the particular landscape that was then, um, was then observed with that fractal. So it's a slightly backwards argument. We're not, in this instance, trying to decode the particular landscape one over the other. We're trying to decode just the category, landscape versus body part. But then I showed you this evidence that that decoding has actually a different content at 200 versus 400 milliseconds. And we did some other work to show that that's the case. Does that explain what we, what we were doing? Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I'm trying to still get my head around it, but... Uh... Okay, so just imagine during the reward phase, what, what would you like to show? You'd like to show in this model of it that the, that the fractal pattern was bringing to mind the, this particular landscape. And the more it did that, the more you'd associate the, the, the reward, you could then associate the reward associated with that landscape with the, with the landscape such that you prefer the landscape in the future. And this is our evidence for that. It says that the, the amount that we decode the specific, the landscape specific part of the category um, is correlated with the ability of the subjects to prefer that stimulus like uh, afterwards. But then the landscape is, is not directly, because you showed like this, this graph before that the landscape is not directly related to the, deci to the decision of, um, so with the association to the rewards, right? So that's yeah. right, it's, it, that's why, that's what, that says reconditioning, that it's really, a, it's an associative prediction that comes from the association between the landscape and the fractal and the fractal and the reward. And most people had generally thought that in fact, most of the action happens in the decision phase. And when you see the landscape that brings to mind the fractal pattern that then brings to mind the reward. But what Wimmer and Shahami argued and we confirmed is that if we can decode what's happening during the reward phase, then maybe that's, a, that's better evidence that indeed it's actually a reward phase learning effect rather than a decision phase prospective reasoning effect. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, I think I get it now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then we move on to replay. So there's a more replay. So that, of course, was not that was of course happening sort of during the task, if you like. So during this 400 milliseconds. So Zeb then went on to do a more complicated task, which I'm not going to describe in detail, but just to just to make one point about what we how we how we analyzed it, which is then to do with the sequences that we saw, also saw in the rodents. So in this more complicated task, subjects actually had six individual patterns, which we are now going to separately decode. So a tree, some garlic, a chair, and so forth. And there was a complicated decision-making process that they had where they actually we gave them up to a minute to do some planning of what actions to do in this sequence. But that doesn't matter for the task. In fact, we weren't able to find the replay had anything to do with that. So here we built, instead of building category-specific predictors, we built, um, we built um, uh, picture-specific predictors, so the tree and so forth. And then the, um, and so now here I'm showing you, we did logistic regression. We didn't want to force it to say that only one or other of the pictures should be um, decoded at any, at any bit. Uh, so just wait uh, one, one minute, sorry, uh, I'll be back. That's fine. We still didn't fix the camera. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's a problem with the cable. We cannot fix it short term, but we will try to make it happen for the next talks. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so we have these uh, six decoders that we can then, um, and we didn't want to be exclusive, right? We imagined that maybe subjects would think about both the tree and the garlic at the same time. So we were, we were sort of, uh, we were um, agnostic about that. So we build these decoders, and now here you have uh, chances, you know, one over six, whatever. And you can see that each of the de decoders, again, work. Now this is, again, the decoders are being shown when the subjects actually see the pictures themselves. Um, but again, we can still run those when the subjects are not, knows, not actually seeing the pictures, but are merely thinking about the, the, the context of the task itself. And again, you see something around the 200 milliseconds is the optimum time for the, for the, for the decoding. And so we'll, we'll actually, we'll go to use that. In this case, we also have tried other things, like in fact, the next task, we use an average over a number of different times. But uh, you can see that 200 milliseconds is roughly a good time for each of these uh, decodings. Um, okay, so then, what we can do is to um, uh, uh, look at during the time that our subjects were actually planning in this environment. So here they were planning to go from, you know, they actually had to plan three or four moves in this task. So they had to plan, you know, to go around the, around the you know, they go from S1 to S2, and they were doing it because there was rewards on these places that, that, uh, that they um, could find out about when they went. But as I say, I'm not going to talk about that because what we did, so we now recorded, so here we're seeing 35 seconds at 10 millisecond uh, bins, I'm showing you the, the probability for each of those decoding states, um, for each of these um, six uh, potential states. So in some sense, this is our decoding of the content of their brain that pertain to aspects of the task, these, um, these sequences, during this entire 35 seconds that they're doing planning. So of course, what we did here was to try and data mine this to understand, you know, maybe a subject are planning to go from the tree to the garlic to the hand, or sorry, tree to the garlic to the, um, to the to the French horn, maybe we would see a sequence going from something where we decode the tree, so state one would be high, to the garlic, where state two would be high, to the French horn, where state six would be high. And so uh, that would be an evidence that they're actually doing a little forward sequence, just like we saw in the in the in the rodents. Sorry, just a quick question. But yeah. Assuming these are independent of each other or um, so, so yeah, so we just treat we just treat the, the classifiers are are it's one against all. So it's just S1 against all the others. But it's not, we're just trying to decode, is S1 being presented? We're not trying to decode, it's not, it's not a, so we have six different classifiers. We don't have one single multinomial classifier okay. because we wanted to have the ability to say that the subjects were thinking simultaneously about the tree and the garlic. So we didn't, we didn't want to force it that it would be uh, one or the other. So you just said, tell us when you're, show the, the god, this is of course where we, we train these, where we show the picture, you're showing the tree, just predict you're, show, you're seeing the tree rather than any of the other items, or, or you're just seeing the garlic rather than any other items. We could then run those separately. It's not one single classifier, it's these six separate classifiers. That makes sense? Yeah, thanks. Um, so that means that we have then, you know, in principle, at any one time, uh, these, these signals don't add up to one, right? We don't think that it's, they're exclusive. We could have, you know, two of them could be, could both be active at the same time. And you can't see that at this level of uh, resolution, um, but, but that nevertheless could happen. So this is what our subjects are thinking about. Like that's what's in their brain. So let's, um, uh, so let's try and understand it. 
So, um, as I say, we weren't able to find anything that had to do with the particular plans that the subjects had themselves. But we were, we were interested in, was there anything related to what the, you know, the task was that the subjects had uh, in this case? So the simplest thing you might imagine is the following, that um, uh, if you think about a sequence in the context of the rodents, that would be a sequence where they only had you know, one path. So like they could only go from tree to garlic to chair, for instance. Then you see a sequence of uh, decodability of S1, then S2, then, then S3. But of course, we didn't, first of all, there's more than one choice. It's stochastic. There's a 50, you know, there are two different actions for each state. And secondly, we don't know what time step we should look for. Should we look for, should it be take 10 milliseconds to go from S1 to S2 or 100 milliseconds to go from S1 to S2? So to resolve those two things, we did uh, the following. So first of all, to uh, um, resolve the, 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 the fact that there's alternative paths, we wrote down the, the potential transition matrix as if the action policy was just even. So 50-50 to go from S1 to S2, 50-50 to go from S1 to S5. So if in Markov chain terms, this is a transition matrix with a 0 0.5 in the, you know, the second um, uh, column and 0 0.5 in the fifth column and so forth. So this shows what the structure of the transition matrix is like here. Um, and, um, and then that would be a for a forward sequence. And then a backward sequence would actually be the transpose of this transition matrix, right? So if you go from S2 to S1, then you just look at the transpose of this matrix, tells you how you go backwards in these, in these uh, Markov chains. And then if this is the pattern of activity at one time step, let's say 10 seconds here, if we project that forward through the transition matrix T, that makes a prediction that if you go from S1, you go 50-50 to S2 or to, S, um, or to S5, then we expect at some later point, the activity in X to look like the activity at time 10 seconds, but maybe at 10.1 seconds or 10.2 seconds, it will look like the action of this transition matrix on this state vector. That the state the transition matrix just moves the state vector one step forward through the entire um, uh, through the entire maze. If we apply it again, it moves a second step forward through the entire maze. And if we apply the transpose of the transition matrix, it goes one step backwards through the entire maze. And then again, a second step, another step backwards. So we can look at forwards and backwards sequences by using this transition matrix. And in the case of the rodents, the transition matrix is a very simple boring upper triangular matrix where you just have ones down the, um, the upper diagonal here, which just goes from S1 to S2 to S3. We have a slightly more interesting transition matrix because the task, you know, the animals, had, the, the, sorry, the, animals the undergraduates had a more interesting uh, task to do. So this is how we resolve the issue of the fact that there's more than one action. We'd resolve it in the most stupid way, which is to say, just imagine that any of these actions that are possible from those states are good enough. And the way we resolve the fact that we don't know the granularity of thought, we don't know the temporal granularity of how long does it take to go from one state to the other, it's just by looking at all possible times. <laughs> it's a very, very boring. So here, what we're doing is um, measuring uh, how much the activity the, uh, at X, um, uh, the, the, the XB is correlated with, with X at um, going backwards versus how much it's correlated with X going forwards. And we take advantage of the fact that because not all um, uh, transitions are possible and the matrix is, is asymmetric, which means that you know, forwards and backwards are distinct, we can measure essentially forwardsness against backwardsness. So there's a difference between going forward in the maze and backwards in the maze. And we can ask whether these sequences are correlated, whether the X at one time is correlated with X going forwards at a later time for all these possible lags between zero second lag and, and 600 milliseconds of a lag. So here we're saying this is what the temporal granularity of course is. For the rodents, we know what it is. We saw this fast movement through space in that 250 millisecond bin. Here we can look at a different time. And the technical reason we look for backwardsness minus forwardsness is because there's strong autocorrelation in the signal, right? So normally the brain activity at time t is highly correlated with the brain activity at time t plus delta for many, you know, for delta relatively small. So we're looking for a small different signal instead. There's now some new methods that look, look, that look directly for this, but I'll just mention them at the end. So when you do that, um, what you see is that um, there's more backwardsness than forwardsness. There's a higher correlation with a backward step through the, trans the, in the transpose of the transition matrix um, at about um, 40 milliseconds time allocation, aliquot of thought. So, uh, so 40 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, rather than 100 milliseconds or rather than 200 milliseconds. 
And that's significant where we're measuring significance by a permutation test, where we're doing all the non-equivalent permutations of the picture in this maze. Um, and then if you look, you can see, for instance, if here we're now looking at the average over participants of all the trials in a session. So here um, we have 35 trials in a session. And you can see that average across the participants, there's a strong preference for backwards over forward sequence, I mean, strong statistically at least, um, at about this 40 millisecond aliquot, which means that we've captured something which is not about the planning that the subjects are doing on this particular task, that they're going from, uh, you know, from you know, the tree to the garlic on this particular trial that they have to do, but is at least it's something related to the structure of the task that they, they, they are facing. So it relates to the structure of this maze as judged by this uh, permutation test. And that's then consistent, and, and it's a sequenceness. So it's a it's a it's a little um, little segment of sequence of the, of what's going on, rather than um, just only the decoding of the face or the tree or the tree or the garlic or the or the chair. So it's a more interesting sort of decoding because it actually has to do with the the the, the graph structure of the task that our subjects faced. Any questions on this sequence replay? Yes, this one in your audience. I have a question about the detail of this experiment. So mm -hmm. that since you you played you played a video in a sequence, let's say in a clockwise mode, as you see as you show on the top right corner, do you think that's uh, the forty milliseconds uh, autocorrelation highly like uh, highly related to the reverse sequence? Do you think this is the effect of a previous uh, display image? So that's a good question. So um, certainly in the task, people had seen, so I haven't shown it here, but uh, when they actually, um, the, the way the task worked is they had to sit, plan for up to a minute of what to do. Then they told us what they were going to do quickly. And then they had to, again, enter the choices that they did one after the other. And then we rendered it going indeed from the tree to the garlic. They went, they, you know, they chose that spot and, and went forward. So, you're, so it's certainly possible that they're just essentially remembering something about the, the particular sequence that they should that, that, that they had particular sequences that they had seen in the past. Now we um, we looked to see if there's a correlation between what sequences they'd recently seen. Um, we didn't find that, and as I say, we didn't find it related to the particular problem that that that, that, that they had. But uh, um, I think it's going to be very hard to distinguish in these cases because, of course, uh, the replay that we're seeing is all related directly to the task. It is known in rodents that, um, and this is something I'll talk about right at the end if I get a chance about exploratory replay, which is that um, in rodents, let's say you have an environment where there's a, a new path that's going to open up, that opens up, that the animal has never tried before. Then if the animal then tries that path, you can then record the place cells that you, you see and you get to, you, know, you understand you know, the new cells that are place cells of that new path. And then you can look back in the past and ask whether for these new place cells you know, that you've only just, in some sense, you've only just discovered, whether the animal had actually ever used those place cells in a replay process before. So maybe even though they're new to us in terms of place cells, the animal hadn't actually been there. Maybe they were sort of prepared in the animal's mind for use during, those, uh, during, that, um, during that time. And indeed, they found that that's the case. So when the animal does this sort of almost like they, they do a pre-exploratory um, replay in their minds or pre-play, if you like, in their minds, that is then ultimately correlated with what we're allowed to do in the world, even if they've never done that, uh, that position in, in the world themselves. So, it's, so in rodents, it's known that there's something which couldn't possibly be a video that they've actually you know, remembered themselves. It's something novel that they haven't, they, they've actually created ab initio. But for us, we, didn't, uh, we, did, we, we, we were not able to try that. You can imagine more exotic task designs, which, um, which look for something like that. Um, uh, and um, I think that actually uh, maybe Mona Garbert has tried something along those lines. Um, but I don't know of any work that really shows that convincingly to have worked yet. Okay, yeah, uh, some very quick, not really related questions. So from the previous, uh, from the uh, uh, pre-play experiment, you are mentioned as from the uh, from that paper, the conclusion of the author is that the memory capacity of the brain in hippocampus, or let's say pattern segregation, is about seven pattern only. Do you see this kind of memory, or say distinguished public? Uh, capability in human brain will reach the limitation. Okay, so I think you're, it's possible that perhaps you're confusing two different things. So the hippocampus can store very many more than seven places in the world, right? So even you know, if you look at the, in a sense, you can, we can do Bayesian decoding 
um, on, the, on, on the centimeter scale for an animal running in a, in a meter long environment. So in some sense, it has a capacity to, to discriminate a very large number of different locations in the, uh, different locations in the, um, in the maze. And indeed, you know, the hippocampus is known, you know, we talk a lot about the sort of structure of the hippocampus and why it should be very good at that. Well, seven plus or minus two, you know, the, the famous number, which of course is also somewhat contentious, is uh, about working memory. So that's the things that you can carry on in working memory, like you're holding a telephone number or things like that. That's where we have this very severe capacity limitation. And indeed, the idea in the hippocampus is that there's a battle between using synapses, which of which you have a very large number, versus using, and, they, and that gives you essentially um, activity quiet memory. So it's stuff which is stored in synapses, but only you only see it when you use it, versus working memory, activity-based working memory, where you have the continuous activity of a bunch of neurons simultaneously. And that uh, activity-based working memory is clearly highly restricted. But the synaptic-based working, the synaptic-based memory, which you would use for episodic memory, for instance, and so forth, and that's what you can see in the hippocampus with its pattern separation and so forth, is much, 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 much bigger than just seven. Otherwise, we'd really be, um, we'd be in trouble. Okay, thank you. Thanks much. Okay, so that's, uh, is there a question in the chat? Um, I'm not gonna be very good at monitoring the chat. Oh, that's good. Thanks. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's, so what I told you about is now replay. So and how we're gonna tell about it in humans, we get these sequences in humans, which we think relate to the sequences in rodents. So now we're gonna to move towards thinking about this in the context of a, of a more interesting task than sensory preconditioning, which is this very sort of boring learning task. So the backdrop for this is a, um, a, a, like a famous distinction in psychology between actually two Edwards, Edward Tolman and Edward Thorndike. Um, which is between model-based and model-free reasoning, which I'm going to illustrate in a very simple way by this very this uh, maze task where we have a little rat. We have three choice points, x1, x2, and x3, four outcomes, cheese, nothing, water, and carrots. And we might imagine that these outcomes have different utilities as a function of the, um, the, the um, need state of the animal. So if the animal's hungry, shown by yellow, the cheese is very valuable, carrots less so, water less so, and nothing, of course, is worth nothing. So in model-based reasoning, if the animal has a model of this maze, then what, what a model means is two things. It knows um, the structure of the maze. It runs left at x1, it gets to x2. Left at x2, it gets to the cheese. Um, or right at x1, to, it gets to x3. And then right, it gets to the carrots. It also knows in its model that the cheese is worth four units in its, in its hunger state, and the, uh, the water is worth two units and so forth. So given that, it would be possible to do forwards planning to think, well, if I'm at x1, what I should do if I'm hungry is to go left at x1 and left at x2 to get to the cheese, just by essentially solving this, this tree by one of a number of methods. This is going to be, this method of control is really easy to learn because it, all the pieces of information just slot together. x1, I go left, I get straight away to x2. That's easy to learn. x2, I get the cheese and so forth. And it's also super flexible, which means that if I change the animal from being hungry to being thirsty, so now the water is worth four units and the cheese is now worth less, only two units, then the animal can flexibly change its behavior and go, instead of going left at x1, and choose to go right at x1 in order to have a better chance to get the, to get the water. So this system is statistically efficient and flexible, but of course, um, in general, it's, it's hard to use because now all the burden has been put at, if you like, at runtime rather than compile time. So if you have a big tree, let's say you're playing chess or playing Go, you have this gargantuan tree of future possibilities and you can't possibly uh, use it. And indeed, uh, it probably has a big load on the working memory that we were just talking about in response to that previous question, because you, know, you have to keep track of where you are in this planning. Okay, so there, but there's another sort of control mechanism, which we can think of as being model free or ref, um, re, uh, reflexive control, where what you can reflect on is the fact that you only really need to know what the value is of going left at each state. So you can learn that maybe going left at x2 is worth four units. You don't know it's because of the cheese. You just learn, I went left at x2, I got a big reward. Going right at x2, I got, a, I got nothing, then going left at this. And then given that, you can also learn by that going left at x1, that in the end, you're going to get four units of reward. And the way you learn that, I'm not going to go through the details as things like temporal difference learning or Q learning, happens by enforcing self-consistency of predictions on paths, which means that here, because you go from a state which is, which you don't know what the value is, to a state here, which is worth four units, you think, well, therefore going left at X1 is worth four units too. 
But you don't know whether that four units comes from cheese, maybe it comes from some other co a big collection of choices, which in the end led, lends, you know, lead, leads up to, to you know, a very large amount of water or something else at some future point. You don't care about that. All you care is, in the end, you have four units of reward in your future by going left at x1, and that's supported by the value at x2, and that value at x2 comes from the, from the fact that you've learned that x2 is, is good. Similarly, you can learn the value of going right at x1 is three. That's enforcing the self-consistency with you know, going left at x3, where you get the, where you get the, uh, going right at x3, I'm sorry, where you get the carrots in this instance. So this method of control, if you can learn these numbers, is really simple. Because now when you're at x1, you're just faced with an immediate choice. Do I want to choose the action worth four units or the action worth three units? And of course, it's better to choose the action worth four units, so you happily go left. So um, in fact, you need something even simpler than that. So here, we actually had numbers, four and three. Really, all you need to know is it's better to go left at x1 uh, than to go right. It's better to go left at x2 than to go right. It's better to go right at x3 rather than to go left. So this is even simpler. You don't even know what the numbers are in this case. So it's one of the triumphs of reinforcement learning through the work of people like Sutton and Barta and those others. That it's actually possible to learn these values without ever acquiring or using a model of the world like this. However, this is, uh, and indeed, it's really simple to use it, right? If you just have directly a policy that says, I just go left at X1, you don't need to do any forward planning or any forward thinking at all. You just have direct access to the information you need for what uh, choices to make at that location, which is great. However, learning is difficult because you're essentially learning by bootstrapping. You're enforcing consistency on paths. You have to learn that X2 is good before you can use that number to reinforce the action you do at X1. And so this is statistically inefficient. And also, if we now switch from being hungry to being thirsty, since you have no idea that these numbers are based on the delivery of food, you, um, even if you knew that the water is now um, more valuable if you're thirsty, you have no idea what to do with that information. So you have no idea how to change your behavior based on that information um, itself. So there's a lot of interest these days. So there's evidence that animals and humans have both these systems. If you were to build a robot, you'd want to build both these systems in two. And so there's a lot of interest in how they get integrated. And one idea, and this now comes back to the replay, is that, um, that maybe the model-based system, which has a model of the world, might offline train the model-free system in the light of its better quality information it has. So you could imagine, for instance, that um, you know, when you, um, if you uh, discover that you're now thirsty that you weren't before, the model-based system could generate a bunch of replay events, which had to do with the, you know, that it's better to go right versus left, and then train a model-free policy such that it already knew that when you start out at X1, it's a good idea to go right rather than to go left. And there's lots of ways of thinking about this combination of online and offline planning. So another, another context, for instance, is in the context of defense. So imagine you go to a, a dangerous, a potentially dangerous environment, but before the danger is there, it might be nice that when the danger comes, you need to have a very fast reactive decision-making process that says, okay, I know how to you know, run away to my safety. But it would be nice if that were also a good, a good action that you chose rather than a bad action. And so a model-based system might train a model-free system um, such that it already knows what to do given an ultimate threat that it has in an environment. So there's lots of interesting sort of defensive um, replay, for instance. So what we're going to do is look at a task where we can see, is there some evidence of any, any, anything like this training uh, going on? OK, so, um, so let me show uh, what this looks like um, in, this, uh, in this task. So here's a task that was designed by Aaron Eldon. So a little bit complicated. Let me take you through it. So there are eight states. And they're connected in a torus, like a, like a, like a donut. So if you go, um, so you go north from the tomato, you're going to get to the pond. If you go south from the tomato, you also get to the pond. If you go east from the tomato, you get to the road sign. If you go west from the road sign, you get to the tomato. So it's like fully connected. So subjects are taught extensively the values of each of these states. So here, in this value structure, the face is worth three, the spanner is worth nine, the tomato is worth four. And in any trial, they're going to be asked, they're going to be put in a state, like say, let's say the face, and they're going to be given either one move or two moves, and they're being asked to optimize the number of points they get. So if you're the face and you're given one move, the correct answer is to go left, because you get nine points for the span. If you're the face and you have two moves, the best thing to do is to go right to the tomato, or to go east to the tomato, and then either north or south from the tomato to the pond. 
So then you get 15 um, points for doing that. And indeed, we designed the maze, the, the value structure, such that normally the action you have to do if you have one step to go is different from the action you do have to do if you have two steps to go. After two blocks of trials, where we sort of test all these beginning points and so forth, we then um, switched over the rewards. Um, so now the, 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 the face is worth zero rather than three, the tomato is worth nine rather than, uh, rather than five and so forth. But the structure of the maze remains the same. So we get to train subjects extensively on this new structure, um, on this new reward structure, and then again, get them to do um, behavior to see whether they're competent at um, making appropriate choices. So what's nice about, again, we designed these changes so that most choices would have to change with this new reward structure that we have. After another two blocks, we then induced another change, but now we're swapping over the frog and the, and the road sign and the tomato and the house. And again, we, we kept the numbers that uh, are constant there. Um, and so now they're again going to have to work out um, new things to do at the tomato and so forth, new actions to do. And the reason we did this is that we, remember I told you that the model-based system is much more flexible than the model-free system. And so we wanted to exploit that flexibility and see that uh, if you know, subjects were doing model-based control, they would then flexibly adapt to these changes. If they were doing model-free control, they would not flexibly adapt to the changes. We thought, okay, we can then also look to see whether or not um, you know, the replay was consistent with that. Okay, so how does a trial work? So in a one move trial, that's just the start of the face. This is the, in the old reward structure. They, they, um, remember they, we trained them extensively on the, num on the reward numbers. So they, we, know, we knew they knew the reward numbers. We're not gonna show them during the, during the context of the, of the trial. That's kind of important. So they have, we show them the face. They have up to three seconds to plan which move to do. In this case, the guy uh, went left um, appropriately. And then we rendered this, this little movie we were talking about where they see the spanner. In two move trials, it's something similar. They have the face, they have three seconds to move, they see the tomato, they have three seconds to move, they see the pond. They never see the numbers of rewards they get, but of course they know what those rewards are like themselves. Um, so to be complete, they have these um, one step and two step trials in sets of six, little blocks of six. And um, we uh, had a number of things that we could use to look at this flexibility. So we also showed, for instance, we had some first trials after a block in which they didn't see this second stimulus. They didn't see the tomato. They had to plan what to do without seeing the tomato. We could see if they needed the tomato as a scaffold for the choice they did or not. Okay, what does the behavior look like in this task? So here what I'm showing you is a function of blocks. So two blocks of the first reward, two blocks of the second reward, and then one block with the new structure where we swapped over the frog and the, and the road sign. This is performance, which is the proportion of the available reward that they collect. And the real data are shown by these solid lines. So the, um, the uh, and remember I told you that there are some trials, some two-step trials without the intermediate feedback, without showing the tomato at the beginning. This shows performance in those. And what you see is that subjects start out pretty well. There's you no know, evidence that they've used the information to build a, a reasonable controller. It gets better over these two blocks. When there's a reward change, so we change all those numbers, even though they know the new numbers and they know the structure is, is the same. They have this very extensive, they have this big average drop across subjects. They then recover over these two blocks with the new reward structure. And then they, um, again, when we do the spatial change, so we change over the, the face and the, um, and, the, uh, um, and the tomato, you can see that again, performance drops and then it recovers. But, but, um, but, this, isn't, but this behavior is not uniform across the subjects. And again, we're going to use individual differences to understand how planning works in this case. So there are lots of different metrics for model-based reasoning here. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple. So one is how well the subjects adjust to having one step or two steps. Do you remember from the face, one step left to the spanner, two steps right to the tomato. So we can ask whether on a one step um, uh, trial, do they do the one step optimal move, so from the face to the spanner, or do they do the two step optimal move from the face to the tomato? So you can see that subjects differ by how much they, in one move or two move trials, they do the one step optimal choice. And then they similarly in two, uh, do they do the two step optimal choice in one move or two move trials. So what's a really flexible subject, is somebody who will show a big um, value here. So on a one move trial, he'll choose a one move optimal um, choice. And on a, two move on, a, on, a, on a two move trial, he'll use a two move optimal choice. So we color these subjects by this measure of flexibility, how much they adjust according to the one versus two step um, behavior. 
But there are other measures of flexibility we can use. So for instance, after the reward change or after the spatial change, we can ask how much does the performance drop? Clearly the performance drops quite a bit on average, you know, like 10 or 15%, but that varies across subjects. And the more flexible the subjects are, so the more that they're just on a trial by trial basis, the less their performance drops when you do this reward change, and also the less their performance drops when you do this spatial change. So those subjects who are good at adjusting to the immediate contingency of the task, so one step versus two steps, are also very good at adjusting to the overall um, changes that have this structural changes that happen in this task. Um, so we have actually five different measures of decision flexibility. So what X move optimality, one versus two, this block drop, this block drop. We also asked how well do they perform in these no feedback trials? That's also correlated. And in fact, we even asked the subjects to draw the maze at the end of the task, both mazes that they see. And we can see that errors in drawing are also correlated with all these things. So I think that's pretty convincing evidence that, there, that the, you know, there's a notion of decision flexibility or model basedness, which our subjects have. I'm going to show you some plots divided by the median split of that flexibility. But all our analyses we did in a linear scale. So this is really just for the show. Um, OK, and then we have these model based model three choices. So let's do decoding. And we can decode individual patterns. So we designed these so they were, these were individually decodable, a bit like this, the second task I showed you with the tree and the garlic and so forth. And we can ask whether we can decode you know, something to do with the task that they're doing, the trial that they have, either as they do it or afterwards. So here's an example of as you're doing it. So um, when they see the face, um, when they're planning, there's three seconds they have to plan, we ask, can we decode the tomato, which in this instance they move into because it's a two-step trial. And you can see that for the low flexible subjects, so the model three and the model based subjects, we don't have you know, particularly good decodability for, the, for that image that they have. So we weren't able to find um, in a significant way the thing that they're planning for. It's actually, the same problem we had in the Kurt Nelson task. Um, uh, afterwards, when they get to the tomato, we can ask a sort of re a bit of a replay like question, which is do you see the face, um, you know, which is where they came from? And of course, you know, because there's a because of a time step, we don't know if they're still not processing the face. You know, it could still be you know, a reverberant activity from the from the from the system. There could be aspects of that, but we can certainly see that we do indeed significantly to cover uncover what where they came from. But it's not significantly different, for instance, between the low flexible subjects and the high flexible subjects. So, so not very interesting. What's more interesting though is that we can ask about sequenceness. So this is not just decoding the face. But decoding a pattern, face tomato or tomato face, right? If you go forwards or reverse replay here. And now, so we're looking at the time of the tomato, we can ask, do we see this sequence of going from the face to the tomato or the tomato to the face? So again, we have this forwards versus backwards decodability. And remember in the Kurt Nelson task, I showed you that we saw more backwards replay. Here we see more forwards replay. And it's specific for those subjects who are more flexible. So the model-based subjects, when they get to the tomato, you see this nice little sequence, face tomato, face tomato, face tomato, because it's forwards and it's only for those subjects. And indeed you can see that this is nicely correlated with a linear measure of decision flexibility, which was a completely arbitrary, me a different measure of, to do with how flexible they are going from one step to two step trials. And we don't only see this when they get to the tomato, we also see it when they get to the, um, the pond. So now at the pond, the, net, the second phase of this two step task, they still see this sequence, face tomato, face tomato, during this time. Okay, so we see forwards more than reverse replay. So this is from the face to the tomato rather than tomato to the face. Again, we, we can tell because it's asymmetric this task. Um, we, in this instance, we, um, uh, we just average it. We're not looking for the precise um, uh, metric, although, um, so we just average it up to these, uh, these lags of up to uh, 200 milliseconds although there's a peak sequenceness at 130 milliseconds. So that's 40. So the, what was 40 milliseconds in Zeb's case turns out to be 130 milliseconds here. We built a model that I'm going to tell you about. And we are, in that model, we could ask when the prediction error in the model is greater than the mean, right? So, so we, we had the idea in that instance that maybe that there are times that the model is uncertain. We had a forgetting process, which we'll see that to be more important than the new model I'll tell you about. We show that only when the prediction error is greater than the mean do we see, do we see this, this sort of uh, sequence replay. And most interesting, we, and this relates to the paper by Van der Meer that I showed you, is we saw a sort of anti-planning. So here we say um, sequenceness for state transitions chosen with one move remaining. So how much sequence do we have? 
um, for the high flexibles and the low flexibles. And this is the probability of repeating that move. So what you see is the high flexibles, when they see a sequence, when you, when, when you see a high sequence, that means you actually got this as a sequence, they are then less likely to repeat that choice in the future. So it's as if they repeat, they have a replay, but that replay doesn't enforce the, that um, action in the future. It actually suppresses that action in the future. And indeed, suitably, that preference happened for cases where they actually got a bad, they made a bad choice before. They make a bad choice, you see a replay of that particular sequence, and then those subjects are less likely to repeat that action in the future. So it's an anti-planning or anti-replay, which actually, instead of being boosted by reward, is actually suppressed by a bad suboptimal choice. And that same is true for both the one move cases and the two move cases. And again, it's only for those high flexible subjects. Peter, there's one question in the audience. If you can sure. just, thanks. Right. I was just wondering uh, if the if this behavior is related to the action or to the uh, pair of the state action. So if the subject does, for example, is in the tomato and then goes down, and then it finds that it gives it a, a low point, right? Um, it's going to go down, like it's going to not go down in other states as well. Oh, good question. Um, so we did not. That's certainly not part of our model. We didn't even we didn't even try to see if they made this sort of incorrect generalization. Um, so as you, as you show the task, right? So here, what you're arguing is that maybe they just learn that going down is worse, and it's like an action perseveration type thing where they just learn this action is a bad action. Um, I don't think so because otherwise um, the performance. Uh, well, I mean, you know, we we did that. We didn't build a model of that. It's an interesting. It's an interesting question. I and mean, certainly in other cases, you can see a, a mix of uh, uh, of um, action based effects and state based effects. But here, it's such a strong state predictor, right? Where we see these very strong you know, tomato and so forth. But I think that they would be separated. But it's, a, it's an interesting issue that we haven't checked. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, you showed that there is some inter individual differences in this decision variable before. So I was wondering a bit about where these differences come about. So one option could be that, which you talked about previously, that there are differences in capacity or whether you have some other idea where they come about and if if it is capacity if you could test that by varying the length of the number of steps people have to do right so in this instance they only have two steps so i don't think it's, it's i don't think it's sort of capacity online planning capacity although of course they have to keep in mind you no know, rewards right so they have there are other aspects of capacity which are there and indeed um you know working memory is very you know very heavily involved in the in the planning process and so well might be that we didn't, in our case, we didn't assess working memory. So we weren't looking at capacity, for instance, which is something you could have. In fact, we know, for instance, that you know, dopamine synthesis capacity is related to working memory. So even you know, there's a coupling between sort of some aspects of what you might think of model-free behavior, which would be this more dopamine controlled learning, and also this model-based mechanism may be more efficient in that case too. Um, in terms of, you know, I think that uh, um, you know, we can imagine various things. One is cognitive control. So basically it's expensive to do this planning. And maybe those subjects just didn't you know they just weren't you know, they didn't think that the amount that we we're going to pay them for their points was actually worth it. And if we increased the number of points, they would engage in more model-based planning. And I think there's some evidence for that when people have explicitly, not in this task, but in other tasks where people have explicitly manipulated the number of points that they that, that, that they get or the number of amount of money they get. So if you make it more mission critical to do the right thing, then subjects will do that. Now we would, we'd assume that the differences disappear or just well the differences become moderated. Now, of course, we don't know how much money I have to pay you to make it work. And in the end, there are some capacity limit. We do know that again, not in this task, but in other tasks where people have compared model-based and model-free reasoning, that in um, things like in psychiatric conditions such as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, there's some nice evidence from Claire Gillen and Nathaniel Dorr that um, subjects who are suffering from OCD tend to use more model-free methods and model-based methods. What they didn't test, and of course, it's, you know, they have to worry about the ethical ethics of this, is that um, and they didn't, and they tested both OCD and also uh, you know, normal people on OCD spectrum. What they didn't test the people with OCD is whether they are, they would be more model-based for the things that they obsess about, you know, like, you know, if it's like washing or things like that, they have an obsession. You might imagine that they're saving their mental capacity for the things that they really care about and not using it for these pathetic points that we provide them on the on this thing. But there's no evidence of that yet that I know of. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so what are the hapless model-free subjects? Um, what happens for them? 
Well, remember we have these rest periods as well. So, so we see replay. So here we would look at replay sort of in the toss in this sort of in this intertrial interval between uh, between individual trials. We could also look during these two minute rest periods after they've done training or just in the middle of the block. And there we saw the contrary um, um, effect, which is that there was more sequencedness at rest during these rest periods as a function of how little flexible you were. And although it's a bit more complicated, we can look, for instance, at this rest period three, which is just after they've had this reward change. You can see that the high flexible subjects, though there's nothing very interesting happening then, the low flexible subjects show quite a lot of, flex, uh, of, re of replay. And we can ask whether they are essentially replaying the old transitions or the new transitions, right? So they're going to have to change what they would do for these one step and two step trials. And they're essentially doing it roughly, at least in this instance, roughly speaking, equally. So both the pre-rest and post-rest transitions, they do equally. And so the, the trouble we think with those subjects is based on evidence that, the, um, that uh, um, the subjects don't have a very good model of the world and therefore they can't do a replay in a very sensible way. And that's consistent with the errors they have. They're not the, this non-flexibility. So if your model is not very good, then you don't really want to be replaying from a model which is actually incompetent. And there's a few other things we know about it, um, about, the, about that uh, replay. Okay. So um, what are the model of this, right? So we'd like to, to um, build a model. Um, so this is what, so in the original paper, we had a model, which was a bit of a hybrid model. And we've had sort of a mix of model-based and model-free reasoning. What we've now done, what Georgi Antonov did, was to build a model in which he looked very specifically at saying, let's imagine that all the choices come from a model-free process, but that model-free process might be being trained by a model-based process. Only knows about the model. Um, and we're going to have forgetfulness in both the model-based system and the model-free system. And that will then mean that we have to do a constant relearning. That's what the replay is going to do, because of course, otherwise the maze is actually constant. So the choices are model-free, but they're informed by a model. And we have forgetting. And critically, the model-based system has its model of the world. It's going to forget that we're only thinking about transitions here, because the rewards they are known. Um, and we think the model-based transitions, they, they forget towards uniformity. You just don't know whether if you go left at the face, do I get the spanner or do I get the tomato or the, or the face? That's what you forget towards. And the model free system forgets towards you know, a, a natural forgetting um, um, target here, which would be the average reward rate in the environment. Right? If you don't have something specific about what the model free system says, those, those values of going left, you think, well, okay, I'm just going to forget and think, well, this transition is no different from any other transition. So maybe I'll just get the average reward rate that I would get in the environment. And we can see that that's a really important forgetting uh, structure. So now we have relearning. What's that relearning? So we have an online learning of a model, right? Because as you go from one transition to the next, you get that online learning. We have online model free learning. You actually get to a state, you find, and you remember what the reward is like for that state. And then we also have this optimized training of model free values towards model based values. So we get a replay process comes along. It says, okay, I'm going to, from a model based system, it allows us to train the model free values towards their true value, the model based system, the model based system believes to be the case. And um, in terms of which things they're going to replay, right? Because then remember, a phenomenon is that they replay some, some sequences and not other sequences. Um, we use this, uh, this lovely analysis that comes from Matter and Door, which relates to an idea that comes from Rich Sutton in the early 90s called Diner, which is the idea that we're going to choose that replay, or the brain will choose that replay, which has the biggest effect on the choices that the subjects will subsequently make. So imagine we're replaying as an optimized piece of planning. You have some error in your model of the world or some error in the way that your model free system will act. And it, we would like to improve that. You find the, 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 the weakest point, the weakest link in your model free system. And you, you know, poke your replay at exactly that to make that better. And Matter and Door showed that when you do that, you get a that the choice of where to do a replay comes from a combination or a multiplication of two quantities, what they call need and gain. Need is just the frequency with which you're going to be at a place in the world in the future. So for us, that's almost um, equal because we have you no know, equal starts everywhere and you only have you know, these very short choices. And so the critical feature there is gain, which is how much do you um, change your policy? What's the benefit of the change in the policy that would come from the replay? So if the replay makes you change your mind about what action is best, that has the chance of improving your, your, your outcome. If the replay has no chance of changing your mind, you already did, for instance, the best action that were already there, it was already had a very high value, then there's no gain for that replay because it's not going to change your mind. So there's only things that change your mind which are going to lead to this problem, which are going to lead to, be, to having a replay. 
we'll see that that's why we get the pattern of replay we do. So um, in the interest of time, let me just show you what this looks like over a whole sequence of, of times. So we're showing here, uh, what uh, George is showing here is two actions and they're change over a set of se sequences of actual actions and also um, replays. So the, there's an optimal action whose value is 10 and there's a suboptimal action whose value is one. So the blue is showing the, the, the current believed model free value for the bad action. The orange or the yellow, I'm sorry, is showing the current model free value for the, for the uh, actual action um, that you try. And then here, these different times are shown by um, online learning, where you actually discover what a reward is like, a replay process, and then a forgetting process. So every trial has these three states. You actually do something, you find out something, you have a replay opportunity, and then you have a, um, and then you have a forgetting process. We, you know, in reality, these are all, of course, mixed, but I just, so Georgie's just separated them out so you can see it more clearly. So here, you can see that in this trial, the, the, the subject, the, the, the model, chose the optimal action, and then because it discovered it you know, closer to 10 than its current value of seven, it increases the Q value of that action. At the same time, it didn't do the suboptimal action, so that doesn't change its value at all. And now, in this instance, it chose to replay that optimal action, and so that actually enhances it further. The model-based system says, aha, I know that this value is 10, I'm gonna improve that value itself. And then we have forgetting. And the forgetting of this uh, value, of course, um, drags the, um, both, both the Q values towards the average reward rate. So here, the average reward rate, the, the subject is doing a reasonable job in this task. So the average reward rate is currently seven. And so it drags the yellow one down a bit to seven and it drags the blue one. Now forgetting is actually makes the blue one, you forget that it's not so good. You think it's actually better than it was. So you get this nice, big, positive forgetting towards the, the current value seven. Then again, you do the optimal action. Again, you have a replay um, for that optimal action. And again, you have forgetting. And so now this blue one, this suboptimal action is getting apparently better and better and better when you don't do it. And after some point now, um, and of course the average reward is going up because you're doing a better action. You're, sub, you're, 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 you're more likely to do the optimal action. But at some point, the suboptimal action, action threatens to, you know, to uh, increase, you know, to have a probability of being chosen because its value it has actually, its notional value has increased. So at that point, you do a replay of the suboptimal action, and now that actually drags it down towards its true value, which is one. That's what the model-based system knows. And again, now forevermore, you're going to keep on doing replays of the suboptimal action because the forgetting is making it uh, keeps on making you think that it's going going wrong. So the reason why we think we get this suboptimal action um, effect comes from gain, which is if you do the optimal action, you don't get much gain in replaying it because you're already doing the right thing. It already had a good act. It already had a good value. And the thing which is threatening you is the suboptimal action. And that's where, things go, uh, that's where the things go haywire. And so in some sense, we have this pessimized replay that comes from this structure of the, of the control. And what Georgie showed is that um, if we look at the gain you get from replay, remember this gain and need, need is basically constant or similar for everywhere. So the gain um, from, um, as a function of how fast you do model-based forgetting, which means how fast you basically think the, that the suboptimal action is getting good, that gain is, um, is, uh, is very big and positive for the suboptimal action. And in fact, if anything, it's, um, it's, it's actually less, it's actually negative for the optimal action because, you're, because um, of the, uh, the, the structure of how it works. Um, and one important modulation of this is that this is modulated by model-based forgetting. Um, and so here, the idea is that the, uh, if your model-based system forgets fast, that means that um, when you replay, you're replaying the wrong transitions, right? So you believe you can go from the face to the, to the um, frog directly, which you can't do. And so if the model-based system is incompetent, doesn't know what the model of the world is like, then it's not going to be able to do a good replay. So you don't want to do that. And this is shown by the action entry, which is to say essentially how much forgetting happens. And the more forgetting that happens, the bits of the action entry, the worse the effect of the, of the replay. So, so it doesn't help you to use that replay in that case. Um, for either optimal or suboptimal actions. Um, let me not go through that. We can then predict the suboptimality of the, the subjects. Okay, so because I'm about running out of time, let me have some conclusions. So what we've shown is this putative replay in NEG. So we have shown the sequence that I talked about. I think that's some evidence that there's some replay going on. And in the eight state task, unlike the six state task, we saw this more interpretable replay, which is really interpreted by the behavioral effect that we saw. We saw the flexible subjects who are more model-based they tended to replay after a trial, right, um, uh, that they had done. 
And it and that replay favored to be decreased choices, choices that they in the end were not going to, that were bad choices they then don't want to do. The inflexible subjects, these model-free subjects, they tended to replay more after a systemic change in the world, right? This rest periods that we saw, but because we think they had a bad model, maybe they forget the model quickly is the other, um, another um, possibility that they're a bit inefficient in the way they do replays. So that's not going to be, that's not a good, a good thing about doing it. And we argue that this is normative given the forgetting. And then there's other evidence of this anti-planning effect. So I showed you this data from Kerry et al. Uh, there's also work from David Reddish's lab in a slightly different circumstance, which shows something similar. So anti-planning, so if you like, not anti-planning, we didn't show that in the Kerry. We showed at least that they do replay, which is not the actions that they do, but the actions that the, uh, well, in the Kerry's case, it's not the actions they're going to do, but it's the bad action rather than the good action in that case, right? It's the action that goes to the food on a, on a case when they're water deprived and they're going there. So how that work relates to the actual planning, we don't know in, in Van der Meer. And indeed, there was no, you know, they showed it was fairly uniform across the entire sequence. So, so I don't want to make too much of that link, but at least it's another example where you see replay, which is not governed by reward as much as by non-reward, which is a bit like what happened in our case itself. So as I mentioned, we use this differential measure of sequences, so forwards minus backwards or backwards minus forwards. And that's because of the strong autocorrelation in the signals. So the brain state doesn't change very much. So there's some lovely work by Yunzi Liu and Tim Behrens um, more recently, where they've uh, actually they've even built a toolbox called Temporally Delayed Linear Modeling Toolbox, where they do a second order model, a bit like a, um, some of the ways that it works in, F in fMRI uh, analysis to essentially overcome the effect of this um, forwards versus re reverse replay. So you can, see, you can see both of them rather than testing one against the other. Although generally, as you might imagine, at any one time, you only see one or the other, you don't see them both, as you can see also in the, in the rodent case. And indeed, you, know, you can see that something very similar to what we, what, what we saw. Although all the work on replay at the moment shows quite a variety of different timescales interesting to what the replay is like itself. Um, so we still haven't seen planning preplay. So in the rodent world, uh, Pfeiffer and Foster have shown that when an animal is actually planning a trajectory from a place it is to a future place that you know where it's going, you can see um, preplay like the, in that forward way, and Reddish has some similar cases in the maze. So we and others, I don't know of any really good case where we've shown forwards planning like that. And I think that the one reason perhaps is that the, certainly in the model-based planning that's happening, doesn't happen at this very sharp time, no, sharp time scale, 40 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds. It happens more through a process of actually conscious reasoning, probably. Um, and so that happens in a much more varied time scale that we're not really capable of finding. And then I should say that you know, we thought about its use of other things. So one particular thing we're interested in is a sort of rumination. Or so people who have anxiety and depression, they often are ruminating about um, aspects of the world or aspects of their state in the world or things that they might do um, to make things better. And so Chris uh, worked on thinking about how replay would be skewed by this and how you might essentially get somebody who's ruminative because they keep on replaying or preplaying um, uh, aspects of the world to try and essentially build policies that try to mitigate the risks that they might face if you're then highly risk averse. And we have some thoughts about why that might be over exuberant in people with anxiety or depression. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.